So now let's do a 15 minutes break and then we'll continue with some shorter second part. Okay? <coughs> okay. So what I've said so far is a sort of preamble of what is coming. Something that maybe you should know. But probably it's difficult for you to find a description of what dissipation is, which is such a in such a so to speak little mathematical construct, okay? Because in general, it's something that is much more complicated. So now we are going to use this and other concepts to enter into the main goal of this, of this chapter, which is the a thermodynamic framework for constitutive modeling. As I said, constitutive modeling is description of the behavior of the material in terms of stress versus strain, and eventually, and sometimes with, with respect to uh, temperature. But essentially, we want to know stresses given the strains and temperature, temperature, or the strains given the stress and temperature. This is what is constitutive modeling. And of course, this is something that depends very much on the material. So there is a part of continuum mechanics which is common, common to all continuum medium, all continuum media. But there is another part which is specific for every material. Now we are entering into that part. The constitutive equation is what make uh, what makes us allowing uh, uh, with, uh, talking about uh, materials, because otherwise we will talk about continuum continuum medium. But talking about material is that <coughs> the constitutive behavior is a specific for this material. So we are focusing a framework for describing the behavior of the material, the mechanical behavior of the material at the constitutive equation uh, level. I'm trying to do provide you with a, an abstract framework in which in abstract looking abstractly at the problem we will define a certain sets in order to define the constitutive modeling so imagine that we are want to model the constitutive behavior of a material and we are interested in several properties of the material several mechanical or thermal properties of this material for instance the strains the stresses, the velocity, the displacement, the density, the entropy, the temperature. These are properties of the material varying at very for every particle of the material and evolving along time in which we may be interested in. Okay? Okay, so these variables define what we said the total the, the variables of the problem. It's a set in which you have a number of variables. How many? Well, uh, and the number of variables of the problem. Okay? Sometimes we'll be interested just in a short, name, t in short number of variables. Sometimes we may be interested in a larger number. Anyway, these are there. In general, all these variables depend on the space and time. Okay? But then, not all these variables here are the same. They can be classif classified in different subsets. Then we define three variables. Look, classifying <coughs> classifying these variables is the starting point of a constitutive model. As we say, we are going to classify, even selecting them, but mostly when we have selected them, classifying the variables appear appearing in the problem into belonging to any of these sets, we are already starting to model the material, okay? Then, we can classify these variables as first, free variables. And some of these variables are assigned to the set of free variables that we will denote lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda and f. Lambda may be one variable or a vector of variables or whatever. There is a number of them, again all them function of a space and time, and there are nf, smaller than nv. Part of these variables are classified into three variables. What does it mean, free variables? Why do we call them throw variables, free variables? Well, because they can evolve freely. We assume that in our material, in our model of the material, rather, the evolution of any of these variables can be any. Okay. Well, this is quite abstract, but essentially saying what variables of our problem, of our material, 
can have a free evolution, can increase their value, lambda dot, which is the evolution per unit of time, the velocity, lambda dot, is the, the rate of change of this, of this variable. Saying that this rate of change can be any, they can be positive or negative, they can be larger or shorter, okay, is something that is part of our constitutive model, okay? But all model, all variables that we classify as belonging to the subset of free variables, by principle we assume that they have free variation, and this will have important consequences, okay? They can take a rate, so a rate of, of change, which is any, okay? Well, some of them will be called internal, also called sometimes hidden variables. Why? Because this is the way that we define some non-observable variables. Look, you know that materials <coughs> are complex. In fact, there is something that we can observe at the macrostructure, but all, all materials have a microstructure, lower scales, and of course, we want to account for the effects of the lower scales into the upper scales of the material, the microstructure, the molecular arrangement, the atom uh, lattice. I mean, there are a lot of uh, behavior or the variables of the material which are not observable themselves, at least at the macroscopic, variable, uh, macroscopic scale in which we are uh, analyzing the material. And then, instead of modeling the or looking for the variables at the microscopic, we use some variables to model the effects of this at these internal scales that we cannot observe. And the variables that represent these uh, hidden variables, the effects of at micro scales, what are scales which are not observables, that we call internal variables. How many of them there are? and i, they are again functions of a space of time. But what is specific of the internal variables? That they have what is called an evolution equation. Every internal variable will be accompanied by an evolution equation that says that the rate of change of this variable is not any. It's defined by a function, g, that depends on what? on the instantaneous value of the free variables and the instantaneous variable value of the internal variable themselves. So mathematically, that says that alpha dot is a function, a certain function, that is part of the model, but a certain function of the internal variables, I'm sorry, of the free variables and the internal <laughs> variables. But, look, there is no lambda dot here. So we postulate that the evolution depends on the instantaneous values, not on the rate of changes, okay? So that's something that is to be precisely defined. So internal variables are variables that can take different values, but whose evolution is constrained, is not any. It's co depend, the evolution, the rate of change of this variable, depend on what is the instantaneous value at times t, of, values, of variables lambda and variables alpha, okay? Well, it's an abstract concept, I agree. But at least it's a co clear concept, okay? It's, it's, it's a mathematical concept, okay? So look, every in hidden variable is always has to be accompanied by an evolution equation. And this evolution equation has to keep this format, okay? Okay, and then, what about the remaining variables? They are called dependent variables. We assume that all the variables which are not free and which are not internal, then are dependent. So each instantaneous value is a function of the instantaneous values of the free variables and the internal variables. Okay, so we have three sets. Free variables, those that we assume that they can take any rate of change. Internal variables, those who are not dependent on the, on the, free, vari on the free variables and alpha values, 
rather, but in terms of this rate. So they cannot take a new change, rate of change, but this rate of change depends on the instantaneous values of the free and the internal variables. And the other ones are dependent values. That means that once we know this and that, the, the, sorry, we know the, the free and the internal variables, the other ones are computable. We can just know them because through that functions, but by replacing the instantaneous values of these free and internal variables, we can obtain the instantaneous value, value, values of the uh, internal variable. Okay? So these are the three sets. By the way, the three sets are subsets of the total V. V, I recall, that was the number of uh, the total variables. So it's are subsets of these, subsets of free, the free variables union the internal variables, union, union the dependent variables, return the, the total variables, and then they are disjoint with each other. So there is no variable that can be at the same time free or dependent or at the same time or free and, and internal. So they are disjoint, disjoint sets. Okay? That's the concept. Let's see the application of that. Imagine that I have a problem in which I'm going to be interested in density, stresses, strains, internal energy, free energy, household energy, entropy, temperature, and some internal variables. And it, uh, that's the variables I'm interested in. Okay? Okay, I postulate that the variables driving the problem, driving the problem, the free variables, those that can take, that drive the, the, the evolution of the material, are for two of them. For instance, density and strains. That is the first step of my constitutive model. Okay? Of course, maybe by this assumption is limiting the application field of my model. I'm not saying this. I'm saying that, okay, let me assume that only those. What can I do assuming that these are free variables. Assuming implicitly that rho dot and epsilon dot can be any. The density and the strains can be any. Okay. Okay. I imagine now that I just take one internal variable that I call alpha. And of course, as soon as, as, soon as I talk about the internal variable, I have to talk about the evolution equation. So this alpha depends Alpha dot, the rate of change of this variable, depends on the instantaneous values of it and the instantaneous value of the internal variable itself. That's the evolution equation. Okay? Of course, the remaining variables, so the total minus rho, minus epsilon, minus alpha, are the dependent variables. And that means that implicitly I am assuming that any of those variables, for instance, the free energy, can be expressed in terms of this, this, and that. Okay? Because they are dependent. It's dependent on the others. This is my, my way of modeling. Okay? Look, th th there are some consequences in that. What about, this is what the consequence of phi being, uh, uh, phi being an, an, uh, an independent variable means that it can be expressed in instantaneous value in terms of the instantaneous value of the density, uh, strains, and uh, internal internal variables. But what about the time variation, the rate of this variable? Well, when I take the rate, of course, the rate could be a function of the variables rho, epsilon, alpha, and the rates rho dot, epsilon dot, alpha dot. But look, alpha dot is not any. Alpha dot is depending on rho e, e alpha. So implicitly, the rate of 5 depends on rho epsilon rho dot epsilon dot, alpha, but not alpha dot. In other words, the rate of change of the internal variables do not, doesn't affect the, the rate of change of the dependent variables. That is what is synthesized in this equation. For instance, the stresses, I am postulating that the stresses as dependent variable are a function of the density, strains, and internal variables, but the rate of the stresses depend on this plus the rate of this and the rate of this, but, and the rate of this, but not on the rate of this. Because the rate of this, through this equation, depends on the instantaneous value of rho epsilon alpha, well, so it's here. Okay, so there are some consequences on that. Okay.